gonna have to have a do small chores day. I use it. I use these old post-it notes to remind me of things I need to do. And my whole table is covered with little post-it notes. They'll all take five minutes, but. How effective are they at that point? I have to ask myself. Well, they work for me. I've always <laughs> made lists. Hi, Love everybody. You. Thank you for turning on your cameras. I love that. I love to see the faces. I understand that sometimes the bandwidth might be uh, keeping you um, from doing that, but it's always nice to at least start off with that. Or the, or the puppy. Mm -hmm. Puppies always steal the show. <laughs> you know, I've been watching the Zoom captioning. Uh, Brittany says bandwidth and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching the Zoom captioning and it's really fairly accurate, except when it makes a mistake, they're really big mistakes. It's Sometimes really I just have to uh, hide my surprise um, because I look down and I see something that I said that was totally mis uh, misunderstood and I, I don't want to dwell on it. <laughs> Because it's embarrassing sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It, the, it, we need to get Zoom to stop putting in bad words. <laughs> it needs an autocorrect, I think. Oh, speaking of young ones. Look, or parental controls. We need an introduction from you today. Who do you have with you? Can you unmute me? Hi, I'm Shana, um, assistive technology, AAC, SLP, MESD, and this is AO and my daughter. Hi, oh, we're so glad you're with us this morning, friend. Can you Thank see you. yourself on TV? Can you see yourself? Good morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. Welcome, everyone. Um, I know that we will have others joining us um, as we go along, but I know we've got a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, so welcome. Welcome to Echo Voices. Uh, this is our second year of Echo Voices in support of our learners with complex communication needs. And uh, it's our voice, it's our chance to talk about what those needs are and how we can support them. Our entire first year was really about philosophy and making sure that you know that you've got the skills. It may be intimidating to think about adding on a complex outcome and uh, teletherapy, but you've got this. And that's where we started. Um, and then this year, we're just looking at different uh, models for integration and implementation. So we've been sharing some great um, sessions and today is no exception. We're so excited for this. Uh, your sign in is your record of attendance. You will be receiving contact hour credit. This year we are uh, sending those to uh, have viewed live. We're sending those certificates out, hopefully within a couple of days uh, with my one or 2.3 FTE of staff. It is a priority to get those out to you, but we're also adding comprehension quizzes. So when we post the um, session recordings at the uh, spot that you see right here in our small newsletter, there will be a comprehension quiz that accompanies it so that you can receive a certificate from the recording. Um, I'll, so you'll receive those uh, CEUs again for the uh, comprehension quiz. Uh, you'll receive 1.25 contact hours and uh, if you complete with the 90% accuracy. So just wanted to point out that we are now using the Zoom closed captioning. Uh, it is built right within Zoom. So um, you should see that if you don't go to your toolbar at the bottom of your screen and then you'll click where it says live transcript and you can change uh, how you receive that. So we're happy that's built into Zoom now. And again, um, you are the biggest reason that we are here. We want to hear from you and uh, you may be intimidated, but don't be because we are all here for the same reason uh, to discuss and come up with uh, solutions and sharing. So please unmute yourself and uh, Gail and I will be monitoring the chat box as we go along. Uh, so either way, we wanna hear from you. Uh, I'm Deb, Deb Fitzgibbons. 
Some call me Deborah. Mostly it was my mom when I was in trouble. Um, but I am the coordinator of the Oregon Technology Access Program and regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairment, supporting therapists. No small task these days. So many things going on and so many questions. Um, I have nothing to disclose other than that this is my job along with my passion. But I am also thrilled to have Gail to introduce herself. We've been doing these sessions together and uh, I'm thrilled for, uh, for every minute of the learning. Gail? Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you and I'm very excited to uh, have Erin Sheldon with us today. She's an old friend and somebody I've been able to work with over uh, several years now. Um, I am an independent consultant. Do we have another slide, Deb? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm an independent consultant in the uh, area of special education, a former uh, school administrator and a former OTAP coordinator. Um, my disclosure is that I am also under contract to three different ECHO programs, the ECHO Voices program through OTAP, the University of Wyoming's ECHO and Assistive Technology Program, uh, and the RSOI's ECHO TIES program, for, which is specifically developed for therapists. Specifically developed by, by therapists, but the topics always cross over. We always that meet is, is a common theme and a common theme uh, for therapists uh, is how do we implement? What are we talking about? And so I just want to point out to you that next time, uh, November 18th, when we get together again, model as a master pal. And Tabby Jones, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. I will probably need to learn. Willibur. Willibur, okay. I've only seen it written. So thank you for that, Erin. But uh, Tabby has been mentioned uh, last week. Uh, Rachel and Chris Bouguet mentioned her as uh, some, uh, as a, pa a model for integration. Uh, she's very well known in this area and this is her model. And so she'll be sharing with us on November 18th, but today we are thrilled to welcome Erin. Some of you may have seen her um, as a participant uh, or a presenter at our conference, I think two years ago. I saw Erin at ATIA in January before the world changed on its ear. And I said, can you come to see us in, um, at, for our conference in April, 2021? Well, she's still coming, but she's coming virtually because our conference will be virtual. So uh, Aaron is uh, presenting with us today, the participation model, uh, planning for implementation. Uh, she's got a wealth of uh, experience and wears many different hats. And she's going to introduce herself and her, uh, tell us about her why much better than I ever could. And uh, I just want you to remember that Aaron will be coming as a keynote and a presenter at our conference. So as you're thinking about what is it that <coughs> is talking about that resonates, these may be the topics that we want her to uh, focus on at the conference in the spring. So just think about that as we go through and make comment about, hey, I wanna know more. And that's how we bring you what you need. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can start sharing yours, Erin. And Alrighty. again, we'll monitor the chat box. Aaron, do you prefer that people hold their questions or do you want them to ask as they go along? As oh, go ahead and just, yeah, just ask as we go along. Okay, all right, excellent. Welcome. Thank you. And let me get us into play mode. Oh, my little Zoom window is just blocking one of my, let's see. That introduction was cracking me up because that 12 year old Maggie is now the 17 year old Maggie. So there we go. That's nice. um, so uh, thank you guys. Um, like Deb said, my name is Erin Sheldon. Um, I work part time as a disclosure for the vendor assistive wear as a special education lead. Um, I've actually been focused um, about the last year or so on the evidence base behind the vocabulary of assistive wares products such as Proloquo to go and um, 
products that will be coming out, vocabulary and how we implement uh, vocabulary and vocabulary instruction. So anyway, it's been great fun. And um, I am also home with a 17 year old AAC user um, who we're actually getting home-based services this year during the pandemic. So she has an educational assistant who comes to our home about uh, an hour and a half every morning and facilitates Maggie to be able to have online instruction with her classroom. So yeah, so that is how we are handling this. And I am talking about the participation model, which I think has been my framework since about the time I met Gail, which Gail, I was realizing that was like nine years ago. It was a very um, long time. And you were the first person to ask me to uh, present at a conference. So yes. I came out to California and we did the Club 21 yeah. event, whenever that was. So I think Maggie was actually about seven or eight then. Um, and I learned about the participation model about 10 years ago, doing a special education project for my own daughter's school district, my own kids' school system. We went to a neighboring school district to learn about their approach to planning assistive technology. Our entire special education advisory committee went. And this was a, a local school district here in Ontario that uses universal design and had an entire school, a pilot school, that about 10 years ago they had implemented universal design. And the speech pathologist at the school explained that universal design works beautifully for most kids, but students with complex communication needs, they have to layer it with the participation model. And so she described universal design as a safety net that catches most students, but our students who need AAC tend to fall through the universal design safety net. And that's where they use the participation model to ensure that they're doing um, the planning that those students need for assistive technology. So she explained it to me and it has been like my guiding framework ever since. And I'm, it's interesting, it's so funny. I, it, I just find that it helps me organize just about anything we just did with Tabby. Um, and it, I suspect if it's the same Rachel with Rachel Langley and Marlene Cummings, we just did a pre-conference. Uh, for closing the gap. Um, it's Rachel um, Maddow I was referring to. Oh, there you and go. Oh, of course, Gay. Rachel. Right. Uh -huh. Oh, well, if, you're, if you follow that podcast, um, we just had an interview with Karen Erickson about some of the literacy instruction that will come up a little bit in this one. So there you go. All awesome people. Hold on, let me get this. My slides. There we go. All right. So, oh, so I have... And um, opened up Menti. I've put all my slides into Menti um, so that you guys can be highly participatory. So Zoom is messing around with me a little bit. It keeps putting our little headshots right over my navigation bar. So I'm going to minimize those for me. Um, but go ahead. If you look at the top of the screen, you'll see the website for Menti and the code. And this is just a quick practice slide to give you guys a chance to log into Menti. Um, when we complete the Menti slides at the end, you will have the option to download um, all of the slides and it will include all of your contributions um, and, and, and participation. So um, I didn't submit the slides ahead of time just to make sure that you guys, some of them will be progressing through, but you'll get them all at the end um, and you'll get to see all of the input that all of you provided. So I know it's a stressful time. So on a scale of cat, are you feeling excited? Barely hanging on? perplexed, sleepy, whatever. And I can see here that at least four of you have been able to join up with Menti. I'm watching this little roster down here in the bottom right-hand corner to tell me how many of you have been able to submit a response. And that's what gives me an idea of whether I should progress the slide or not. Is anybody having trouble joining? Could, uh, could somebody put the number in the chat box, the code, that might be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I 
I've been doing so many Zoom meetings and it's, well, you guys have all, we've all been doing so many Zoom meetings. And I had a meeting about a month ago where the entire presentation had been put into Menti and it was such a refreshing change that I decided going forward, I will do that as often as possible. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and progress to the next one. You'll see that this code and the website will stay at the top of every single slide. So if anything comes up, it's easy to reconnect. Um, so before we get going, what inspires you about AAC? What brought you to the field? What excites you um, in terms of what you're doing for your students by implementing AAC? Go ahead and submit those and I'll also give folks who are having trouble joining Menti a chance to to join us. Supporting st students who need communication access the most. I love getting to see the AAC unlock learning, improving quality of life for individuals and their families, seeing the child get it and start communicating. I love to see them communicate their needs and wants, to see kids be able to participate better, the ability to give kids a voice. I love it when kids begin to tell me things I didn't know, finding out what they're thinking. Okay, awesome. Hearing a student or client's voice and thoughts for the first time, seeing learners who've been given a voice become active participants in their lives. Awesome. Yeah, so this is exactly what has brought us to this field and we will uh, come back to this a little bit when we think about what participation is according to participation level. So now what forms of AAC assessment do you currently use as you're evaluating students for AAC? What are some of the tools? I've just put in some of the most common here. Set process, communication matrix. Functional communication profile. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you check others so we can hear what you were thinking when you clicked that. Okay, very cool. So it looks like a lot of you use the set process, the communication matrix, which is awesome. The DAG2 functional communication profile and at least one person uses something else. Okay. Oh, and there's the pragmatics profile. I personally love the prag pragmatics profile, but I think it's because I tend to work with such complex kiddos. All right, so let's break down the participation model and we will be referring back to both of those things we just did. If you have ever opened up, for example, the Buchelman and Miranda AAC textbook, um, it is massive. I once evaluated the reading level of the big AAC textbook from Brooks Publishing that um, Pat Miranda and David Buchelman published. I think the reading level was like grade level 26. So I forgive you if you struggled with any parts of it. Um, but it is a brilliant model that Pat Miranda has given us. And basically what she is saying is that in order to support our students to meet their communication needs and participate in life, we have to make sure that we are unpacking barriers they face both physically, their, their, um, op their access barriers. These are their whatever the nature of their disability is that's getting in the way of, of that's impact, impairing their ability to participate as well as their opportunity barriers. So she just gave us this framework to make sure that we're evaluating um, both of these. And this is a slightly more just simplistic version. We can think about our students having two kinds of barriers that they face. And so again, those access barriers are the nature of their disability. It might be differences in how they coordinate and control their body, how they receive information from their senses, um, how they have, have learned and are learning language and literacy, um, how their brain works in terms of thinking, cognition and attention. But then the other kind of barriers is the opportunity barriers. And these are the results of how other people respond to the student's disability. So it's really separate from our student's biology. It's separate from their, their um, 
their disability. And these opportunity barriers can be everything from the knowledge and skill level of all of us and of their educators and their families. It can be the practices and policies within our systems and it can be the attitudes that kind of guide, you know, the mindsets that guide all of those practices and policies. And we're gonna spend some time kind of unpacking what those look like. First though, one of the things that I find most compelling about the participation model is how we conceptualize what it means to participate. Um, and Pat Miranda makes it very clear that what she's thinking about is what is it that people without disabilities are able to do? Where, what are they participating in? How are they participating and how are we making that accessible to our students? And so I think of it as having kind of four broad outcomes that we can think about for participation. Um, the most obvious for AAC obviously is communication, that our students have the skills and the technology that they need to be understood um, and understood by a broad range of people, not just familiar people and for a broad um, range of purposes for communication. Um, everything from social to commenting and expressing opinions and protesting and requesting and all the like. But then there's also educational outcomes, right? Because I think most of us are working within a school system. And so why are we going to school and are we participating in the actual learning of school? Um, are we learning the essential skills and knowledge to be able to participate in society um, and to be able to participate more broadly in things like voting and right, the civic responsibilities of, of being a member of society. So are we learning the essential skills of language and literacy and numeracy and technology so that we can really participate in our communities? Are we developing the social outcomes so that by the time we leave schools, we have close friendships and strong family relationships and our communication partners are effective um, and have our community has learned how to support our <laughs> communication, especially the more complex the needs of some of our folks, the more that our communities really need to be prepared um, to be good communication partners and to understand and support our students. And are we developing the skills of self-determination, right? Again, that's getting back to concepts of citizenship. Like what does it mean to have control, choice and control over our own lives, but also transition planning, right? So as students become teenagers and enter secondary, are they leaving school with the skills to participate in the most important decisions about their life um, and to really be able to express their, their own individuality and their own personhood? And Pat, uh, Pat Miranda talks about um, when she when she shares the participation model, making sure that we're looking to kind of age appropriate norms, like what is someone without disabilities of this same age in this same space? What are they learning and how are we creating access to that? And I think this part is self evident, but why does this matter is these are all the reasons that you guys just mentioned for what brought you into the field of AAC. We are providing a voice to students who don't have one and therefore accommodating that, um, that disability of complex communication needs. Um, we're providing access to the general curriculum and to all of the learning that happens. And that's because, you know, partly just because it's the right thing to do, um, but partly because our own federal laws mandate, mandate that all students have access to the general curriculum. And you simply cannot access the general curriculum without AAC if you have complex communication needs. Um, we are making sure that when we provide services and supports and accommodation like AAC, like speech therapy, that that service is removing a barrier to participation rather than creating a barrier to participation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but it can mean that you know, sometimes in response to a disability, we provide, we create a special program or create a special service. Um, and that very strong good intention can itself become um, a way that students are not, not now able to participate in the life of their schools or the life of their communities. And we're making sure that we're providing equal opportunity. We know, for example, that there is huge variation between the states. Um, in terms of which populations of students are currently getting access to AAC. But our longitudinal research is really showing that school systems and states 
that provide AAC as early as possible to the broadest range of students, to whatever students cannot meet their needs with spoken language. Those are the same states, the same school systems with the largest number of students who are symbolic communicators by secondary. So we know that you have to have access to the technology um, for some of our students for 10, 15 years before you actually learn how to use it. But you certainly can't learn to use it if you've never had access to it. So uh, these opportunities, creating equal opportunity um, is just kind of, I think, one of our, our driving principles. So when we go back to the ways that we currently evaluate students, um, for AAC, we can see that different evaluation tools are better at some things than others. So for example, the functional communication profile and the DAG2 um, are very effective at assessing access needs. The pragmatics profile, the AAC profile, the SET framework um, also look at things like opportunity barriers. They also look at things like communication partner behaviors. So how is the person being interpreted? How are they working within the environment and what's in front of them? And the project core, I'm sure you guys are familiar with project core, um, their self-evaluation tools that are part of Project Core that give staff an opportunity to reflect on how they're implementing AC. Um, it's really the only tool I have found, AC evaluation tool, that focuses entirely on opportunity barriers. So it's not really asking questions about how students are accessing technology. It's just asking how we're implementing it. So there's a range of tools and it really, I hope this visual just kind of helps us think about how we need more than one tool in order to make sure that we're really I'm looking at all the barriers our students face. So I won't spend a lot of time on access barriers because as medical professionals, as school professionals, I think these tend to be the most well-known. Um, these are the most likely to be captured in you know, the kind of ordinary feature matching that we do um, and all the common assessments that students with complex needs face. Um, the kinds of access barriers that our students face, they might be um, cognitive in terms of limits to their attention, to their memory, to their ability to retrieve memories, to retrieve words, um, self-regulation. It's also linguistic in terms of how our students are learning to understand symbols and spoken language um, and what words mean and how we change the meaning of words by how we put them together, how words can be represented either in print through literacy or visually through things like graphic symbols. Um, but it's also our students' sensory needs, whether they're able to see and touch and access whatever technology we put in front of them. So these tend to be already the most well-documented with the students that we support. And what I thought was just useful to think about is how all of these relate to each other. So for example, a student with significant motor needs may have not physically explored their world very much, particularly if they also have sensory needs such as visual impairment. So we know that that directly impacts things like cognition and learning about the world and the student's ability to learn through sort of incidental experiences. Um, and students who cannot produce speech, which might be a motor need, struggle in their linguistic development if they've never been able to explore language and combine words and be able to actually participate in language as opposed to just hearing spoken language but not be able to produce it. So access barriers always interact with each other. Um, and I think the students that I focus on the most are students who both have significant cognitive and intellectual disabilities as well as motor disabilities as well as sensory um, disabilities with, you know, in terms of their hearing, their vision, their, sens um, their sensory processing, all the like. And that makes it extremely difficult to assess any individual one piece to know, for example, what's a sensory need or what's a motor need versus what's a, what's a cognitive need, but that can become its own topic. Um, so I thought we'd just stop really quick and just ask, so how do you currently evaluate access barriers amongst your students. Some of you already mentioned some common tools, but what are some of the things you currently do maybe with an IEP team to evaluate the access barriers, the nature of the disability that your students face?
task analysis. Mm -hmm. Multidisciplinary teaming with related services, absolutely. And the more complex the student, the more multidisciplinary we usually need that team to be. Observation, mm -hmm. mostly informal consultation, consultation task analysis, getting help from the Adaptive Tech Center. Yeah, so finding external expertise, a set meeting to help float things to the surface, taking a team approach, absolutely. So this kind of, I think the, the big message we're getting here is we can interview students, we need to know who, what it, we need to gather the knowledge of the people most familiar with them. Um, <laughs> in some of my districts, we're still struggling to help other professionals realize that there are access barriers. Absolutely. Okay. So you guys have lots of different approaches for doing this and observation being a really key one. So now let's look at opportunity barriers because these don't tend to be as carefully evaluated as access barriers. And the way that Random Yukelman describe opportunity barriers is they sort of group them in five areas. Um, there is policy. Policy barriers are when access to AAC is limited, li limited by some kind of policy. Hey, sorry, my doorbell rang and the puppy was um, losing his mind. Um, so access to AC is, limited, is limited by someone's policy or regulation. This means that someone in authority has created this barrier. It could be your state legislature, it could be your school board, it could be the head of the AT department, but it, it means that a formal decision has been made. A practice barrier, people often mistake practice barriers for policy barriers, but a practice barrier just means this is the way we have always done it. Um, and we often assume that the way we've always done it is, is required. Um, but um, but actually, it's actually something that just a, a group and a multidisciplinary team can evaluate. Sorry, an electrician has come to fix something in our house and my husband's taking care of the dog. Knowledge and skill barriers are talked about the most frequently when I talk to speech therapists. And it's where, for example, the knowledge about AEC implementation um, maybe rests mostly with the speech language pathologist, but access to that knowledge um, is more limited. Access to AEC is more limited, limited because other team members um, don't have that same level of knowledge. Or maybe they've learned about something in books or through webinars, but they haven't learned how to apply that knowledge. And that's when we see skill barriers. And then what tends to overlay all of this is attitudinal barriers. It's when mindsets are really what's getting in the way um, of how we implement AAC. And you know an attitudinal barrier when you come across it. And we're actually gonna spend a little bit of time practicing kind of how to, how to identify these different barriers when you come to them. It's interesting, one of the, the things that always cracked me up in um, the Buchelman and Miranda text is Pat talks about um, simply directly confronting an attitudinal barrier and saying, I think your attitude is the problem is rarely an effective strategy, right? It's something that we tend to need to work around. Um, and I think it's something that your own Echo Voices program addressed a lot last year by, by really focusing on mindsets and um, kind of a, a common language and common um, understanding of what everybody's up to. And again, just like access barriers, opportunity barriers interact with each other. So a certain policy about how AAC is provided can really inform practice, um, how we might fund or organize professional learning, especially for classroom staff and communication partners, can be influenced by what we fund and what policies and what practices we have and the like. And so it's very difficult to, to simply address one of these individually. But you guys already mentioned the set process and the pragmatics profile. What are some other ways that you currently evaluate um, opportunity barriers? Go ahead and take a minute and fill those in. Observation, staff interviews, what people say and what people do, taking a social inventory. 
brutal self-reflection and environmental assessment. Uh -huh. Informally, discussions and feedback from training and coaching, student and family interviews and conversations. One more second to see if you guys have more. Case by case, looking at how the student is interacting and how his academic data is coming along. Again, task analysis. What are the goals and what's standing in the way? Okay. So let's practice identifying opportunity barriers because just identifying and naming them is often half the challenge. If you have a situation like this, um, actually, this is, this is uh, you'll hear from Tabby in two weeks. Tabby talks about the biggest barrier she faced is our district does not provide teachers or aides with release time or funding to attend workshops or trainings on AAC. This is the barrier that led her to create the Master Pal program, um, those modules. What kind of barrier is this when a district is not providing that kind of professional release time? Um, or funding for professional learning. Policy, practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also reflects attitudes, attitudes and mindsets about where our priorities are. So I think you guys have nailed it, right? So it's largely about policy because it's a funding decision and therefore a decision maker. Um, someone in authority has made that decision, but that decision very much reflects the knowledge and attitudes of the decision makers, um, you know, of the system itself and the practices of that system. Because so often what we do policy-wise is a reflection of just what we've always done. How about this? When Medicaid funding or any specific funding system restricts how we provide AAC and how we provide um, those kind of, of speech therapy services. What kind of barrier is that when we see it? Again, yep, overwhelmingly it's a policy barrier because it's a funding decision, but it very much reflects mindsets and practices, so attitudes and practices, okay. How about our AT team is swamped with AAC referrals? I'm sure none of you can relate to this. Um, but because of the large number of AAC referrals, we cannot also provide support with AAC implementation. What kind of barrier are you facing when this is the situation? Mm -hmm. I can tell you guys have been talking to Chris Begay and Rachel Madel, um, because just the fact that, you know, this, this consensus around the fact that it's often about practice and skills and knowledge of the team, it, it very well could reflect the policies, for example, the funding system of wherever you work. Um, but often this kind of thing is um, reflecting the practices, just how we've always provided assistive technology to this population, which very much, again, reflects the knowledge, the skills, the attitude um, of the team. How about this one? I call this the kale theory of AAC. Our staff treat AAC like kale or quinoa. It's a good, healthy idea in theory, but they don't actually cook it or eat it. What kind of barrier is that? Yep, really reflects largely the mindset around AAC, but also very much the knowledge and skills um, of that team itself, right? They may, they may actually have a mindset that AAC is important, but they have, but don't have the knowledge, skills, or practices um, to implement it. Okay, awesome. Um, how about when speech therapists only provide AAC services in one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions? So they're not available to coach teams in the classrooms or provide any kind of that, that in-class job embedded support. <laughs> okay, absolutely. It really reflects all of these barriers coming together at once. It's often largely a practice barrier, like you guys are saying. 
um, but it can really reflect the policies and funding systems. It can reflect the knowledge, skills, and mindsets of the whole team. Okay. How about when classroom teams are only modeling AAC during a few specific routines? So maybe they get it out during shared reading and they get it out during snack time, but otherwise AAC stays in the closet on a shelf. Okay, you guys are really nailing it. This off, this really reflects the mindsets, the skills, the knowledge, and the practices of the team, right? And often people will do what makes them feel competent and effective. So if they know how to use AAC during those specific routines, they'll do it. But if they don't have the habits or the mindsets or the practices to do it otherwise, then we're gonna see that very limited use. All right, out of curiosity, how much do these five kinds of barriers affect your work? You can rate them um, in terms of which ones you feel are having the biggest effect um, on your work and which ones are having a more minor effect. There we go. Oh, wow. Okay. So skills and practices. That's interesting. This is exactly the same um, responses we got in our pre-conference at uh, Closing the Gap last week. Skills, attitudes, practices. Okay. I'm going to give you another scenario. What about when you hear some students are too low functioning to learn AAC? What are you hearing? What kind of barrier is that? Largely attitude, mindset, yeah, but also very much the knowledge, the practices, and skills of our teams. So this, to me, really gets into where our access and our opportunity barriers that our students face really overlap, where a student who has access barriers around things like cognition and intellectual disability, memory, um, language development, control over their body, sensory motor impairment, that overlaps with the attitude and knowledge and skills and policies and practices um, that we work within. And that middle area between these two um, is where we see assumptions about who's capable of learning and how much they're capable of learning. It's where we see the enactment of things like um, how we teach and what we teach and how many resources we put into it. So the quality of instruction and the quality of resources. If you've ever been into a special education classroom that hadn't been provided with any formal evidence-based resources, I call it Pinterest special education, where it's whatever teachers can find for free on the web that often reflects, again, these assumptions about who's capable of learning. And so it results in fewer resources or lower quality um, resources. If When we see a um, failure to provide that kind of professional learning for teams, right, you can see it really reflected in the quality of, of staff development that's coming into these classrooms. So then what kind of barriers? So here I've combined access and opportunity barriers. So what kind of barrier are we up against? Is If AAC is only provided after a detailed individual AAC evaluation, with no intervention, no, no exposure to AAC before we do that detailed individual AAC evaluation. What are the barriers that we're seeing here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity barriers are really clear in terms of we're seeing a reflection of policy and practice um, that we're not even giving students the opportunity to know what AAC is before we're evaluating it. I'm noticing that no one is selecting the access barriers, sensory motor impairment, the student sensory motor impairment, I've combined them, or their cognitive and language development um, or impairment in those. Well, so that's, real, that's very interesting to me. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you about that. They seem like um, very different uh, items than the 
than the first five and mm -hmm. um, maybe a part of a detailed AAC evaluation, but how do you feel like they fit into this model? Um, just that we have to be aware of both of them, right? So for example, if we don't have any kind of what, for example, Chris and, and Rachel on their podcast talk a lot about having some kind of universally available AAC system. If we don't have access to something like that, that can be accessed by most students or some kind of response to intervention approach um, where we have some version of symbolic language that we're making available to students, letting them observe and model, um, then we will never, we'll never meet both of these. Like, I think we have to, we have to figure out a system that does both. Um, I've been in school districts where LAMP or Proloquo to Go is provided automatically to every single student with complex communication needs, which is great. I mean, it's great that there's a universal system, but if there's not been any evaluation of students' motor skills um, or their vision skills, and there isn't, uh, we're still, we're not going to do anything different until we also take these access barriers into consideration. Um, then I just think we run into we, we run into trouble, right? There's no one single system that can be accessible to every single student. Um, so I'm still I'm actually Gail still exploring how these all interact, but I'm I actually haven't gotten this response before to this question where people have only identified opportunity barriers and no one said, but I think that this is really about better understanding. Like we can't provide AC without this really detailed individual AAC evaluation. So right. to me, this, this tells me this is an audience that has really thought about opportunity barriers. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm, let me think about it. Well, maybe we'll talk later. Okay, okay yeah, keep too. thinking about it. I'm, I'm wrapping my brain around it. I'm with you, Gail. I think it's about, making sure that we're finding this space in between. And that's the power of tools like the set process, right? It's making sure that we're always looking at the space between um, and not assuming that we can solve all AAC issues with just opportunity, just addressing opportunity barriers or just addressing access barriers. I think that's the only point that I'm hoping to Well, and maybe uh, the, that part of it is some approach to kind of UDL. Mm -hmm. For this population, um, I, I, yeah. I'm going to think about it some more. Okay, cool. This is like the conversations we're having at ATA. Yeah. So, um, so this is another one. This is a very common prerequisite here in Ontario. Students have to demonstrate communicative intent and knowledge of 20 symbols before AEC is even considered. And that doesn't so like, where's the roadmap? Where's the roadmap that gets me from a purely pre-symbolic communicator to having knowledge of 20 symbols and developing communicative intent? What are we seeing? What are the barriers we're seeing when we see this kind of um, candidacy model? So you guys have identified knowledge, attitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I completely agree with you guys. I think it's largely knowledge and attitude, but all of these, this is the overlap. This is where I feel like it all comes together that yes, our students have really significant impairment, right? And we have to be aware of that, but we also have to be addressing those opportunity barriers. Now, this is really interesting. How about when we hear, my students aren't motivated to use AAC. They prefer to communicate what they need with gestures or sounds. And you might hear this from families, right? There's a lot of people you might hear this from. What kind of barrier are those students up against if this is the, what we're hearing? I feel like these responses really reflect the work that you guys have already done with Echo Voices. Um, because in different audiences, I've seen this skewed very much the other way that of course, it's about the student's disability. That's why we're seeing this, not so much the opportunity barrier. So anyway. I think that if we believe they can do it, that it's going to, it's going to fuel everything else. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. No, I think you're exactly right. So this is where to me, opportunity barriers um, come together with exactly what you guys are doing in Echo Voices and that you're both evaluating the needs of your system as a whole, of your state as a whole, of how to better support staff within these individual school districts, as well as how all of you here in this group as speech pathologists are trying to evaluate the needs of individual communication partners, you know, individual families or classroom teachers or paraprofessionals and the like. And it's figuring out how do we address um, kind of one group of barriers in a way that supports um, these more individual ones. I think when I see a, um, this kind of systematic approach, like what you guys are doing with this project, I'm, this is to me where we're seeing the merger, where we're addressing all of it together, both at a systems level, as well as at the individual um, kind of professional level. So I think you guys are- I'm proud to say, Erin, you mentioned SLPs, but I'm proud to say that uh, we've got OTs on with us too. and and. Uh, you know, the, the team approach is, is certainly catching on. Oh, that's very cool. Well, and that I think it also gives you so much power when it comes to assessing those individual access barriers, right? Because those OTs are such an important part of that problem solving. So um, we'll get into the case study in just a second, but um, this is just a quick question. What can we do to remove more barriers to participation? I think you guys are already doing a lot of this stuff. Um, but what, what do you feel best removes a knowledge barrier when you are working with classroom teams, professionals, families, educators? What are the things that allow us to remove the, the knowledge barriers more than anything else? Oh, interesting, mission statements, staff training. Yeah, workshops, webinars, staff training. Okay, so you're developing some consensus. It looks like around staff training, job embedded coaching, information sharing like workshops and webinars is kind of maybe the primary, the primary ways that we share more knowledge. Okay, let's go to what removes a skill barrier. Remember skill is how we apply our knowledge. I've never used Minty before. I kind of like it after I figured it out. Isn't it fun? Yeah, it definitely has a little bit of a learning curve, but it's had less of a learning curve than the Zoom tool. Did you say that the handouts will also be there for us? The, the slideshow will be there for us to reflect? Yeah, at the end, you can have it emailed directly to you and you get it with all this interaction. Cool, thank you. Sure. Um, so what else, What can we just brainstorm? What else removes knowledge and skill barriers within these different systems? <laughs> Sharing successes, mm -hmm. and those exemplars, echo voices. <laughs> Video models, partnering team members, <laughs> trainings, practicing using AAC, embedding it into the student's day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having people at home and at school trained and using the tools, yeah. So that whole circle around the student. That's what I love about Menti is that everything that you guys are now submitting here becomes part of the slide so easily. So it'll now be part of your handout. Having a clear vision of where we want to go. That's where I really like to think about those outcomes that we talked about at the beginning. Like what are the outcomes we, we're trying to get to that helps us develop that clear vision. 
Regular frequent training echo podcast. <laughs> Having a community of AC specialists to support and train us. Spreading out the expert title to everyone involved. Absolutely. Okay, these are so good. All right, so now what removes a policy barrier? When policy barriers were, and it's someone in authority, such as a funding decision that is the biggest thing that we're up against, um, or one of them, what are the things that can really help us remove a policy barrier? New policies and procedures, mm -hmm. workshops and webinars, especially if they help get people on board, mission statements that explain the rationale behind what we're doing, staff training, yeah, coaching to help people implement the new policy, technology. What I'm trying to get at it here is I remember when I first came into this field, it was about 10 years ago, and it was all about the iPad and apps. And you would have thought that an iPad with apps could remove every barrier a student faced to AAC. And I think that what I'm seeing here really shows that it takes a, a whole package. There's no one thing. But when we're up against a particular kind of barrier, we can be more targeted and strategic about how we, how we approach it. How about a practice barrier? So it's not formal written policy, but it's just the way we've always been doing it. What helps us kind of overcome that practice barrier more than anything else? Coaching, training, especially if those staff trainings, like staff meetings, we're really talking about why are we currently doing something? What's the outcome we're trying to get to? And is what we're doing actually working? So I, I would have put self-evaluation in, but anything that, that really gets us considering that. Uh -huh. And workshops, webinars, even if it just helps us understand that there's other ways we could be doing it that we haven't been. Any no. other ideas? Go ahead. Yeah, any other ideas? Um, this is Gail again. I do a lot of work in the area of uh, systems and administrative support. And one of the things um, that I keep wanting to add to your list is um, it, administrative involvement, knowledge of the administrator about the kinds of barriers we're addressing, um, uh, okay. encouragement from supervisors. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I think that's really key. The, the pre-conference we did last week, that was a big focus. We actually had, I think, maybe a third administrators with otherwise the bulk being um, AT, AAC specialists within their system. Because yeah, so much of this is stuff where we really need to be um, partnering with administrators, educating administrators and influencing administrators. So for example, one of the things that came up a lot um, last week was if you're an individual SLP, if you're an individual therapist or educator, it might feel like there isn't much that you can do to address policy and practice. But sometimes just having a small pilot project, um, one of those exemplar success stories like um, one of you have already mentioned and being able to share that information with administrators, being able to collect data um, in, a, in a small pilot that you can then share and use that data to help um, influence administrators so that we can change policy and practices. So that you know, be. I think taking some of that data as the, uh, information about what is needed and then offering uh, suggestions to administrators about how they can help. The, I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of administrators don't know mm -hmm. um, what some of the issues are, but if we can mm -hmm. say, you know, how about if we add one line item to the budget or mm -hmm. talk about a AAC successes in staff meetings, things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that was the influencing part. I liked what you said about that. 
Well, we also talked about there's a, um, a really cool, helpful model of, of change theory. And it's the idea that people go from pre-contemplation to contemplation and then continue through a change cycle. So pre-contemplation as an administrator is when you don't see a problem. Your professionals are taking care of a problem. You know, some students can't talk. You've got professionals who are dealing with it. If there's no problem to solve and with what we're doing is currently working, then you're pre-contemplative. And so sometimes what we need to do with leaders is shift them into contemplation, which is recognizing there actually is a problem. Um, collecting data that shows that maybe students are having better outcomes um, in some places than others, where practices are different in one place rather than another. Being able to see that a different intervention results in better outcomes, that that's the information that can move decision makers um, to, to shift into contemplative. And once you're in that contemplation mode, you're going, okay, so there's a problem and we need a solution. What's the solution? And what are those plans? Like you just said, like, what are what could we actually do now? Um, and what resources what, what would we need to do that in order to, to do something different? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cool. Um, and sometimes we and can resort good. to the, um, because it's the law, but we really want mm -hmm. them to see beyond that. We don't want to play that card right off the bat. Exactly, exactly. Well, and that's actually a really nice segue to this one. Um, so what actually removes an attitudinal barrier? Like what is the role of the law? It's interesting, but some, there's a certain percentage of the population that just being told this is the law, you have to do it, is enough. That, that motivates the change that needs to be seen. Whereas for others, it needs to be much more um, involved. It can't, be, it can't be just, this is the law you have to. Whoever's clicked mission statements. I really, I have seen some of the most growth around attitudinal barriers around helping teams develop that vision of where we're going. So that's kind of what I'm getting at with a mission statement or a vision statement. Like what are the outcomes we're trying to get to? What is our purpose for being here? Why are we doing this? Um, and what could we do better? But again, the way that you guys have also pointed out, look at the strength here amongst the job embedded coaching. Just seeing someone else do it, coming into your space and showing you how to do it removes an enormous part of the barrier because for so many of the, the communication partners that we're supporting, it's all theory and they need to see how it actually works in practice in their own, um, in their own classrooms. Um, how else can we remove attitudinal barriers? Any other suggestions that you guys have? I'm slightly behind schedule. So I'm just gonna move it along just a little bit just so we can get to the, the short case study. Observation. Webinars with AC users. I was hoping someone would say that. Hear success stories of other students, but hearing directly from AC users, that is often where that is the most powerful, particularly if physically an AC user appears like your complex students or the students that you serve, and then being able to actually see that outcome, having a conversation with someone who's developed the skills um, that you're hoping your students will develop. Yeah, modeling, case studies, supervisional enforcement, passion and dedication for the work can be contagious. Absolutely, you guys all shared at the beginning um, your reasons for being in the field. And that really has to be shared with the people we're trying to influence so that that passion and dedication, um, I don't wanna say contagious during a pandemic, but can be just, can go viral in the same way. So what removes an excess barrier? I should have had AAC user testimony here, hearing directly from um, oh, no, that would have been for the additional barrier. So how about access barriers? What removes access barriers for students? So now we're getting back to the physical nature of the disability. Do any of these things actually help us do that? And here's where we're seeing the power of technology, right? Also coaching people, training people, providing that more more knowledge so they can better recognize the access barriers, but this is where we're gonna really see um, you know, whatever that latest technology is, might be really helpful with specific access barriers or speed steps. 
cool. Okay. So, um, hmm. I think this will be really quick. I'm gonna throw out some really common practices. If you go to any AT conference, any AT conference, you're gonna hear about these practices. And I just wanted to think about like what, what barriers specifically are these addressing? When you go to a school and there's core boards posted all around the school or in the playground, is it addressing policy, practice, knowledge, skills, attitude, or specific access barriers of students? So you guys are saying that it's addressing attitudes, mindsets, it's giving people an opportunity to practice skills, probably just raising awareness, helping to shift practices, but it's also providing an actual tool um, that can help with the language development um, and, and actual physical access to AAC of our students. What about when we're modeling AAC while we're interacting with a student? What are the barriers that we're addressing when we do that? Okay. So we will be just us modeling AAC might be improving the skills and attitudes and knowledge of the communication partners, um, helping to shift practices around the student, but at the same time, also addressing the language development, the, the graphic symbol recognition, the, the specific uh, impairments our students are facing. How about when we have things like happy hours with staff so that they have an opportunity to practice using AAC when students aren't there? in some kind of informal setting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's about sharing knowledge and shifting practices, but it's really about developing that, those skills and mindset. Um, I'm gonna skip through these last ones. Oh, I'm gonna go back to self-evaluation. Self-evaluation by classroom staff. When we use any form of self-evaluation tool so that the IEP team can really ask, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it having the effect we want it to have? Could we be doing it better? What do those kind of things, what kind of barriers do those kind of practices remove? Attitudes, practice, knowledge, skills. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so very quickly, this isn't a very detailed um, case study, but I will show you a case study. This is a student, Cameron, he's age seven. He's placed in a multi-disability classroom with inclusion in a general education first grade class uh, for specials like music, art, and gym. He uses an iPad to watch for entertainment, to watch Netflix, YouTube, um, to look at photos and videos. He has significant developmental delay. He has no expressive language beyond vocalizations and some word approximations. He has very inconsistent skills, um, being able to identify some important letters in, that are represented in his own name and inconsistent skills identifying um, printed photographs of familiar people. And he currently has no AAC beyond a single message device um, that he uses every morning to say his name during morning circle. Um, and he has some laminated uh, photos to request preferred items. So this is Cameron. What barriers does Cameron likely face to getting um, greater access to AAC, greater participation in his school community just in life.
So you guys are identifying his cognition, his language development. Um, those will be important. Um, attitude, the mindsets, the attitudes of people around him, the practices. Yeah, so it's very global. I would argue given things like inconsistent recognition of photographs, um, there very well may be some sensory impairment there as well there. Um, a lot of these students have things like cortical visual impairment that would make things like recognizing photographs, um, especially like a laminated printed photograph of a familiar person um, more difficult. So when there's a disconnect between what we see students do digitally on a backlit device like an iPad or a smart board as opposed to what they're doing um, with something printed or laminated, then that's just one thing I would think about. Um, what would you do beyond the things we already talked about to evaluate Cameron's access theories? Is there anything that this very quick case study um, makes you think about that you should evaluate in order to understand Cameron's access needs? Mm -hmm. Task analysis. Uh huh. You guys talked about having interdisciplinary teams of occupational therapists. Absolutely, I would get the occupational therapist involved, and probably also personally, um, a teacher for the visually impaired, some kind of functional vision assessment, CVI evaluation. Uh huh. If you submit something after I click the next slide, it will still show up on your handout of the slides. So just to keep us on time. And how about, how can we evaluate Cameron's opportunity barriers beyond what we already talked about? You guys, you guys identified several opportunity barriers that a student with Cameron's profile is gonna face. You talked about addressing his access barriers with things like determining staff attitudes towards AAC, but again, that's gonna be as much an opportunity barrier as an access barrier. So any other ways that we would evaluate Cameron's opportunity barriers, the policies, the practices, the mindsets, the skills or the knowledge of the people around him. Modeling to staff and coaching for them. Mm -hmm. You guys talked about observation. And one of the things I really observe um, is the comments that people make, right? So as we're observing, the language that people use is often a really interesting indication um, of either mindsets, also just asking if this is the way we've always done it. Is that written down somewhere that it's the only way to do it? Or do we have like, where do we have flexibility? Looking at the student's goals to see if he has the opportunities to practice and really making sure that his goals are aligned with those outcomes that we talked about at the beginning, right? So what are the outcomes we want Cameron to have? And are his goals actually things that if he meets them, he will get closer to those? those outcomes. Uh, following up on our, the data that we collect through the SET process and in interviews to make sure that we're really removing those barriers and expanding his, uh, his opportunity to participate. Let me just give it one more second to see if there's anything else anybody adds. And feel free to unmute if you'd rather just say something. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, going back to the chat box, um, someone who had to leave, who does, isn't able to respond now, said that um, the strategies, but what kind of strategies can we use when the, uh, when attitude is the barrier? Is it more on <laughs> uh, rather than coaching? Any specific questions? And Shana um, went all, agreed to that. Um, mm -hmm. And admin is already aware, but feeling sympathy for teachers and their high workload versus addressing their own attitudes. Mm -hmm. identify no. the problem in the same way. 
So, so I actually tried to find research on this. What is it that best addresses attitudinal barriers? And what I found in the research was cognitive dissonance is what most addresses attitudes. And so that means having examples, having exemplars, seeing things that make you go, have I been making assumptions that weren't actually based in fact. And so the more that, it, so it obviously depends on the particular attitudinal barriers, but if the, you know, if I'm hearing a lot of language about how low functioning a student is, then that tells me something about the mindsets behind the assumption of what's possible for the student, you know, that we've kind of mentally capped what we think they can learn. So that tells me that I need to find some examples of people who appear low functioning who are able to have outcomes, who have outcomes that are beyond what I thought were possible for this particular student. Um, you know, honestly, Stephen Hawking is a great example of a person who without the set process, right? Who without appropriate assistive technology was extraordinarily low functioning. What was different in Stephen Hawking's case was he actually had the technology and the support he needed to fully participate now that might persuade some people, but not others. But it really gets at the idea that, for example, Stephen Hawking was a full assist when it came to personal care. You don't have to be continent to use AAC. That is not a prerequisite skill. Um, but that comes up when people are talking about um, which students are, poten are potential candidates. Um, so finding those exemplars, finding those complex AAC users um, and helping people develop a vision of what these outcomes look like, even for a student with an extremely complex body. What we're trying to get at again is that, that cognitive dissonance, that realization that I've been making assumptions um, that weren't entirely based in, in fact. And that's, that's the, the single most effective way of, from what I've been able to find so far um, to address attitudes. So whatever we can do to get people to first recognize what assumptions they're making and then question um, whether those, those assumptions are actually um, based in fact. And so what I do with a lot of teams is is there another explanation? So the student that I actually modeled Cameron off of, um, that's not his actual name, but the student I modeled him off of, the speech therapist said he is so low functioning that he doesn't even recognize photographs of his own parents. How could he possibly learn AAC? Well, the way I create cognitive dissonance is saying, is there any other explanation for why he doesn't recognize photographs of his parents? And when he finally had um, a, evaluation, a functional vision assessment and an evaluation for cortical vision impairment on Christine Roman Lansky's scale of one to 10 for the, the degree of severity of CVI, he was a one. He had profound cortical visual impairment, but that actually hadn't come up. That access barrier hadn't been identified um, before by that team because of assumptions about, about the student's body. So looking for other potential explanations of what we're seeing that's making us presume one thing and something else so that we at least have another avenue to investigate um, and something else to consider. This is what I think families are instinctively trying to do when they say, oh, but my child, they use their, their app at home or in this situation, my child said this, they're trying to, they're instinctively trying to create that cognitive mis dissonance to say, you don't think it's possible for my child here, but I've seen it here. And so that gives us the opportunity to say, okay, so what is it about that context? If he's using it at home, but not at school, what is it about that context that is enabling this ability, that's removing this barrier? And how can we um, try to replicate that in the school setting? as opposed to videoing no, what's happening at home. I, I have to say, yes, what's happening because mm -hmm. the, if the staff have never seen it, they are wondering if this parent is trying to make us think they're higher. Up. And I'm not trying to read what, the mm -hmm. students say, but I would see that unless you had proof of that, because I've had, I've seen a student who was a selective mute, um, mm -hmm. mutism and Nobody at school believed it until they saw the wonderful video of presentations that this kid was giving to his own family. So mm -hmm. make sure you have proof of that if you need to. And so that is the think... end of our conversation, Erin, but there have okay. been a number of people who have stayed on. So it's obviously something 
uh, that you're resonating. And I have really enjoyed the thought processes that you've taken us through. So I'm gonna offer an opportunity for last questions from folks and um, wrapping up, but I think we found a couple of things that you could share with us at our conference, um, overcoming the attitudes and uh, talking more about coaching are some, some common things. Anybody have any last questions for Erin before we let her escape? Well, it sounds like you did an excellent job, Erin. Um, and I know that you did. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing and I love following you whenever, if any of you are not on the quiet listserv, when I see a comment coming in from Erin, I know it's always going to be thoughtful, uh, well thought out, and it might be long, but it's a very comprehensive answer because I love that about you, Erin. Um, you think it through, you give every uh, perspective, and the one that always rings true is that of a parent. So I, I thank you so much for being here and sharing with us today. We look forward to welcoming you back to our conference next year, even if it is uh, virtual. And everyone, um, please uh, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for that. And uh, everybody take care. We'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Erin. That was delightful. And it was absolutely thought, delightful. Thought provoking. That's I, I put together in my brain while you were talking, I put together two 